It's a rainy day, so let's start. Let's let's wait for a couple of minutes and then start. OK, maybe to be coming on the way. Okay, so let's start and then, uh, well, I'll give you a few logistical stuff, and then others can join in the meantime. So today we're going to continue well, our journey with the whole testing view of an embedded system. Uh, but before going there, because given you started lab three this week, I also wanted to make sure you guys understand how does the lab really travel to the later than the big picture we had at picture view, right? If you remember this slide, we had exactly in picture view, and it was introducing lab right? This lab view slash project one. This is the one that we just finished last week. So basically, what we do, if you think about like system layer perspective, so we have the hardware, we have the sensor, actuators, processors, motors, and what we have used in the lab, and the IMU as well. But then what's different in lab is is we introduce the real time operating system, right? So in lab three and lab one, you guys were working bare metal, right? There was no operating system. The application is running by the hardware, right? Just burn the hex there. But lab two, we uh, applied well, the concept of real time operating system that we covered in the lecture by deploying three arms on top of this hardware, right? So we introduced this layer, the top, these three arms, and then we did run our tasks on top of them, right? Why did we need an arm, especially in lab to stand project? What do you think? Why did we need an arm? If we didn't need it in like the past two laps and then in project one, we didn't. Yeah. But in the first half. Yeah, because we had multiple tasks, right? So if you look into the flip diagram of the project, well, you had at least four or five tasks based on whether you did that. That bonus or not, and then you want to schedule all these together. You want to make sure that they will never interfere, right? So each one has to run for a certain time, and you want to make sure you meet the deadline. And the system as a whole works in an orchestrated way. The only way to do this is to have a real time operating system or a kernel that basically does the task scheduling for you, right? So this is why we needed the R. Then, lab three, which you started this week. Well, takes it to another level, right? So remember, we have a full uh, system stack. So we had the hardware, 
has the artists and then the applications are running on top of this. But then if you recall what you have done in project one, you needed to deploy all, all the tasks, all the way the details yourself, right? There was no libraries to use, there was no uh, help or firmware that can give you some kind of functions to use, right? If you remember what you have covered in previous courses, especially programming games, like 2SH, 2SI, for example, well, you cover the piece. You write, for example, an algorithm for sorting yourself, right? But then at the end of the day, you learn that in fact in industry, you barely write like something complex from scratch, right? You have already existing modules that you can build on top of them. They are already optimized and they're open source. For example, this is the STL from C++ or the header files from, uh, from C or uh, also the standard library from Java, whatever length of Python, the same thing, like Python is very rich in terms of open source libraries. So generally in a large scale project, uh, you need to use something existing because if you are focusing on the big system picture rather than taking one small module into it, right? And for this purpose, we take it one step further for project two and the end of the, the labs, because our target is to have this autonomous vehicle, then you cannot really write everything from scratch, similar to what you have done in project one. How did you save? What did you introduce? What is our live resource in, in, uh, in project two for those that start with the lab this week? Do you know the name of the firmware we are using? We're using multiple contact libraries. Mentioning none of them, yeah. <laughs> you always, yeah, you always basically that the protocol. It's you always, it's the way of uh, it's part of cross, and it's the way of communicating between messages. But you always embed it in our firmware, like it has a name, right? Yeah? Any idea? How many people did you already go to the lab session? Start building the lab. Multiple, right? Did you hear the word BX4? Right? Yeah. So BX4 is our firmware basically that you guys use to uh, embed libraries that can help you well, use them without even building them from scratch. For example, BX4 gives you a mechanism to basically query the IAU, for example, the same thing, right? Without really needing to go through a register by register basis, similar to what you have done in the previous labs, right? Just a high level C code that you can basically query a function as returns to the value, right? So hopefully you have seen this in brief compared to what you have seen in project, uh, project one, right? Uh, in addition to page four, we're using also something else. What kind of mechanism are using for communication between uh, Raspberry Pi and the BX4? I'm sorry, and the uh, and they can use the microcontroller. control. Yeah, uh, math -made. exactly. That's another example of an existing open source library for communication uh, that is building on top of your org to allow you to communicate between two chips in your system, right? Again, you are building a larger scale system, something like as if what we're building will be a large scale, but support system. You don't need to implement your own protocol or algorithm to talk between Raspberry Pi and the FME, right? You don't need to say, then by then, I want to implement an I2C or a UR, and then it goes, that it's going to take forever, right? So we're building on top of this mapping to enable this communication between even two different programming languages. You recall this from the start of the, of the lab, right? We have Python in Raspberry Pi and we have C in the FMU. Then now I need to seemingly communicating between both, right? Good. So basically, if, if you have this in mind, uh, that between project one and project two, what we introduced is basically this layer of firmware that you have your tasks running on top of that to scale your system. Good. Are we good so far? Then another thing we introduced in project two is we want to take it towards having an autonomous base. So far, everything was manually controlled by you, right? So you use the RC, you use the terminal to control the car, uh, you use the telemetry to communicate between the terminal and the, and the, and the car, but you never had it autonomously uh, run, right? And in project two, we want to have it autonomously run. And this is supposed to be the end view of, well, the vehicle you have, which I also have here physically. So how can we make it autonomous? We introduce other sorts of sensors, right? What sensors did we introduce in this lab? Yeah, ultrasonic is one of them, which is what we have here. Right. This one, right? So we have the ultrasonic as a sensor for uh, obstacle avoidance. What else? Yeah, the camera, right? So we have the camera. So we are using these two together to basically enable autonomous vehicles 
uh, well, you sense the surroundings. Remember again that we are doing this because we have cyber physical system where you need to sense the physical moment, right? Through your sensors, and then to lay the data, you test it. I'm going to come into this point right now, and then take an action that controls or activates the physical world. For us, the physical world really is the motor that determines whether the vehicle should stop, go left, right, or go back. Basically, do the obstacle avoidance and tracking that we do. Good. So we need these sensors as well. So if you go back, these sensors are basically lying in that well. Most layer of the system is part of the hardware, and then we use the firmware to communicate with these sensors, right? And we use that as very high. As a companion computer there. Another question that is in fact related to what we are discussing right now in lectures, what we're going to discuss soon, is why do even we need a Raspberry Pi? Why, for example, I didn't bring in the camera, the ultrasonic, and then I keep using the microcontroller, the NU, the ARM Vortex M. You should ask yourself, are, are we basically willing to just complicate the system for no reason? Why do we need a Raspberry Pi or basically this top layer of the system? Yeah. If you think about it from a system design perspective, we are in fact making the vehicle heavier, right? We are also making it more complex. Raspberry Pi is power handy compared to the microcontrollers. We also need another source of power. All of this is a complication, right? So why we might need to do that? What do you think? There's need to think of why we are doing what we do in the lab, right? So, and, and how to connect it to the whole system in very system perspective that we have in the beginning. Yeah. More memory is one reason. Why do I need more memory? Or someone wants to say something? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's one reason. We introduce those sensors, which use the camera, but the camera is you being capturing at a certain frame per second. It's a lot of data, right? It comes very fast, and at the same time, it's a huge amount of data. In that case, the microcontroller is not able to cook up in this way of processing the state, right? Because you don't have memory, that's one thing, but also because you won't have what else other than memory. You don't have enough processing power, right? So the microcontroller is real time, it's very fast in terms of taking actions, but it runs at few megabits, right? So it cannot cook up with that large speed of video capture, right? You need something that is in general type of right? For this reason, we are introducing the Raspberry Pi. In fact, you can take the Raspberry Pi out and put anything else, as we said before. You can put an NVIDIA Nano, you can put any, any a little bit, they call this a companion computer, and you want them in, in, in buggies. Uh, you basically want something to be able to process faster and has no memory. It can be any single board computer, right? Uh, we make the Raspberry Pi because it's portable, it has a lot of support, but you can also make anything else. You can make a, a Google TV, right? So there is a lot of things we can do with this companion computer. But for us, at the end of the day, we just have it, right? We, in fact, also introduced Raspberry Pi for another reason, which is this, the, the part that we are in right now in the course, which is discussing high performance medicine, right? If you think what we, uh, I will come into this picture back, but if you think what we started this part of the course, which is predictable architecture for high performance embedded systems, we said we're going to abstract our system view into this system on a chip, right? Where you have an interconnect and then you have multiple processing elements, CPUs, GPUs, AC, and FPGA, doesn't really matter. And then they share some hardware resources. You should cache it, shared main menu, right? But if you try to apply this to the MD board we have, the microcontroller port it's M4, in fact, they are more similar, right? The M4 is much, much more simple than this, right? right? It's a single board. It does not have GPUs or anything else, it does not have main memory, right? So why are we introducing this? Because we want to tell you if you want to have a real embedded system, something like this autonomous, small autonomous vehicle, you need more data, a camera, for example, and then those simple traditional embedded systems can no longer really process what you want to do, right? And then to be able to do this, you need something more powerful. And that's in fact an open area right now, both in research and industry, how to make embedded systems more bulk in terms of performance, but it's still eat their time dynamics, right? And this is what we discussed, for example, last lecture about caching, right? So we took this block and we said, well, if you have an embedded system with shared caches, caches get you very high performance, as we discussed, but it's not predictable, right? Can someone remind me why it wasn't predictable from last lecture? Why caches are problematic for embedded systems? 
Then, so if I want to, based on top of what you said, I would say it reduces the huge variability in the identification time, right? If you make the cache is very fast, if you miss it, the cache is very slow because you lose the memory. But we said this is good for average case because an average case generally you met. But in terms of embedded real time embedded systems, you need guarantees, right? You need to tell me that in worst case, if you have this breakage on the road, you cannot say, well, on an average, I'm good and I can't do since the camera in, but I don't have guarantees. Because what about if you have a in traffic bunch, you have a traffic sign. You want to make sure that under all conditions, in worst case scenario, you always finish your tasks within a dedicated deadline, right? This is the theme. If you remember the theme to be uh, contrasting embedded systems to general purpose systems, this is one big theme of embedded systems. You must have timing guarantees because these are usually safety critical systems that, in fact, without the timing guarantees, you no longer can certify them or put them in the streets, right? So, caching are not good for timing guarantees because, in fact, it has huge variability, right? And then we, like last time, we discussed multiple things. Uh, well, basically, you how can we make them predictable, right? You can do partitioning, you can do locking. Partitioning can be set partitioning, way partitioning, right? And then we can use the scratch pad, which is software managed cache, right? So this is the big summary of the last bit. And I told you, basically, you have the slide. We maybe rush a little bit towards the end. So uh, I promise that I will take any question about the last lecture, especially the last part, if anyone has any questions. Did you have any chance to even look into the slides? Maybe not. You guys are done with the midterm season, right? I hope, or not yet. You don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like I've been since March 31st. We have like half stone and like a lot of stuff. I see. Like, yeah, well, that that's fair enough. But my suggestion is, if basically if you keep throwing in information, as you can see, it's it's a, it's a system course. So we build on top of each other. So if you skip one lecture. Uh, well, skip means basically at least you don't give the slides a lot, and you have some questions in mind, and we build on top of it, so it gets more complex and complex and complex, right? So my goal is to give, give it basically uh, a lot, and then also the editorial probably helps you solve some exercise problems, then if you have questions, with me. okay? So now if I go back to this view of the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi is a typical example. It's not, in fact, a strict real-time system, right? It's usually called this a code cyber system. Uh, of course, commercial, which you can really buy from Amazon, for example, right? But it serves as a good example of something that you can use as a high performance processor in your index, as we do in our data in the, the project. So, if you look into it, just to let you know what we find is really practical, is here at the core, you have the multi core uh, ARM uh, A53 or 57 depends on what Raspberry Pi uh, you have. But you have a multiple cluster, right? And then this multiple cluster, which is this picture on the left, if you abstract it, then you also have it connected to uh, what well, some IOs. We are using these IOs to connect it to our FMV, right? And also to connect it to the camera and the sensors, right? Then if I look inside this block, you will find that you have your four cores. Well, these are the ARM uh, cores. And then they have a shared memory. Like you can see here that there is. An AMBA AXI bus, which is an example of a shared data connect. This is the lecture before the last lecture, right? When we discussed, uh, and this is also what you covered today in tutorial in the morning, right? These are the examples of an arbiter, because AXI is an example bus, right? And then you need to arbitrate it predictably to have um, real time guarantees. And then also it has shared caches. Uh, where to find these? Might be here, but it's very hard to see for me. Uh, and then you have a main memory, basically, right? So if you remove Raspberry Pi from here and you put, well, the, the block diagram of uh, NVIDIA NAND could be just pretty much very simple, right? You have a clustering pool. Well, it might also have another cluster of GPUs, accelerators might be in a TPU, but then it's a shared data connect, it's a shared cache, and it's a shared memory, right? It's why we abstracted all of this in this high level diagram, right? And then we are studying this in terms of embedded systems, but both on high performance and real time guarantee. Good. And as I said, we have taken basically the interconnect, the shared cache, and today we're going to cover the object shipment. Good. So is this big picture for you too, right now? How can everything find connects together? Good.
So, as I said, we're going to basically take this block right now as an official memory. And the next lecture, we're going to take actually inside the micro architecture itself. If I go inside the CPU or here, if I go inside, uh, sorry, if I go inside the ARM, uh, how it can be predictable, not predictable. Well, I would order processors. And if you have uh, well, shared L1s, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so. Starting from the historical perspective in this is something very much similar to what you have done in using the CI, uh, the C board that you used in your second year project. Traditionally, very systems. In fact, they didn't have any main They didn't have DRAMs, right? You only use SRAMs and flashes sometimes for those programs. So SRAM has been the option for real-time safety critical systems. And the reason for this is, well, SRAMs are very, very predictable, right? But you have something in your memory, single cycle access, the random access, Right, so you send a request to any address, you get your data in a fixed time, right? Great. So in terms of predictability or traditional embedded systems, it's the best option. The problem with this is, again, if I take it to something that would require a huge amount of data, I get processed something from a camera, in that case, it's no longer valid, right? It's, it's no longer applicable. Why? Because I need gigabytes of memory. SRAMs are very expensive because they are composed of six transistors. I hope you might have seen this in an electronics course, for example. But the idea is that one cell of an SRAM being of six transistors makes it very expensive to compose large memories out of an SRAM, right? That's why if you look into your laptops, for example, or desktops, you will find that your cache is sometimes it's written uh, in, in the label of the CPU. You have, uh, well, 16, four, maybe 64 kilobytes of an L1 because it's an SRAM. You might have up to four or eight megabytes of an L3, right? But that's it. You never see a processor uh, saying, well, these are two gigabytes of, uh, of an L3, right? Why? It's too expensive, right? On the other hand, if you think about a main memory DRAM, as we said before, like the DEM that you can also buy from Amazon or Best Buy or anywhere, it goes to up, well, I can have a laptop nowadays with 128 gigabytes, right? Why that's the case? Because DRAMs are much cheaper, right? It's a different technology, right? Instead of six transistors, they have one transistor and a capacitor, as we will see. But here I'm showing you some examples of forks that tries to, to well, you don't need to, 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 to worry too much about these papers or citations or industry solutions. But the idea that I want to convey to you from this slide is recently, because of the challenge I have discussed here, that SRAMs became very, very expensive if you want to scale them up and the embedded systems would like much more memory because they are data hungry right now. You need DRAMs because DRAMs are not originally designed for embedded systems. They are not predictable. There is a plethora of solutions trying to really enable them to be predictable, right? So in the past decade or so, there has been so many works, both from industry and academia, to try to enable main memories to be predictable for embedded systems, for real-time embedded systems, mainly avionics and automotive. Good? Is there any question? Okay, so we said SRAM was the traditional thing for embedded systems. DRAM is the traditional thing for average case or what we call general purpose computing systems, right? Your laptop, for example, or desktop or a server. First of all, well, we discussed why SRAMs are good for embedded, but then the question is why DRAM are good for general purpose systems? Well, it's very low cost. It can give you very large capacity and it reduces very large or high bandwidth, right? Nowadays, if you look into DDR4 or DDR5, they run at 3.2 gigahertz, right? Something that is even faster than the processor itself, right? So DRAMs, from a general purpose perspective, they are in fact an ideal use, right? But if we take this back to our course, which is an embedded system, what is the most important thing for an embedded system, especially a safety critical embedded system? Well, it's the performance predictability, right? I must have guarantees, as we said, in terms of timing, when do I finish this stuff? I give you the example of an airbag in a car uh, in lecture one. If the airbag does not stop within the dedicated deadline, it does not basically finish its task, which is sensing the crash and then processing it and in that take the action to open the airbag, you will lose the drive of mind, right? In the meantime. So we said the correctness of the system, an embedded system, does not depend only on the functionality, right? It's not a mathematical that you run for well, some variable time and then as far as the, the result is correct. You are good, right? It's something that the correctness also depends on the timing. If you have the correct result in the wrong timing, this kills the embedded system, right? 
take the example of the air bank, the air bank opens after the, like the, the, the corresponding deadline. Well, the crash has already happened. We already lost the drive, right? So it's a very severe consequence uh, in terms of losing the timing, right? So predictability is the first most important thing to run in the system, especially in safety critical in the system. Now, if we want to adopt DRAMs into one to see just why it's challenging, we want to adopt DRAMs many So the way of thinking of a system designer is the following. Right now, this embedded system that we have in the car, I want to add camera, I want to add the leader, I want to add many sensors that basically collect a huge amount of data. Fine. Who can process and store a lot of data? I will get a high performance processor and then I will get a DRAM, right? This, this is the logical thing. But the idea is that. Well, is it that simple? Can I make range in a DRAM and it just works fine? Well, we have to assess it with regard to your system constraint, right? Does the DRAM meet the constraint of an inverse system? Being it meeting the constraint of a general system system does not entail in fact that it meet the constraint of a an inverse system, right? So we need to assess it in terms of predictability. Well, DRAMs are called random access memory, like this one DRAM is dynamic random access memory, right? And this one is static random access memory. So DRAMs are uh, random access memories. These are usually covered as redundant caches. They are supposed to be covered in a future picture course. Please use some background. Uh, but maybe I should ask, how many of you know a little bit the theory of the work with the DRAMs? Or you have seen it in a previous course? Can okay. you raise your hand? No? Not a single one. Okay. So you didn't discuss it. for those that take 40 m. You didn't discuss this 40 m. Is that correct? No. Okay. Okay. Good. So I have. Well, I wasn't very sure. So I, I have three slides that basically go through the theory. So I, I'm assuming no uh, previous knowledge. But good. Thanks for letting me know. So the idea of a DRAM is it's called random access memory. But as we will see, in fact, the access leading to the DRAM, unlike the cache. Or unlike an SRAM, in an SRAM, I told you, you go to any address, you bring the data and fix the time, right? One cycle, two cycle, and it's regulating the leadership. DRAM is completely different. DRAM, you might really suffer a few cycles, 10 cycles, or you might suffer covers under the cycles based on the state of the system. What is the DRAM? This DRAM itself has a huge variability in terms of operation, right? So basically, from the theory of the operation is I have my CPU. This and uh, something a module on a chip called a memory controller that takes the request load store requests from the CPU and then send them to the main memory. And then the data will go to the main memory, bring in the data, and give it back to the memory controller, which gives it back to the CPU. DRAM operates on what we call a multiplex address path. You don't really send your whole address to the DRAM. What you do is you first send what we call the row address and then the column address. As you can see from here, a DRAM is composed of an array of cells. It's just like a matrix of cells. This matrix is composed of rows and columns. We have what we call a row decoder and a column decoder. You have a load mass in your cache. What is going to happen is you go to the main memory, first provide the row address, bring the whole row from this array matrix, put it in what we call a row buffer. This is basically the sense amplifiers here. So here I hold one full row, let's say one kilobyte, four kilobytes of data. And then in the next, next stage, I will send the column address to bring in a certain number of bytes from this row, right? So it's a two stage operation. First of all, bring the whole row to this row buffer, right? For this row buffer, since amplifier. And then send the column address to take few columns or few bytes out of that row. Good. Why they would basically have this multiplexity address with DRAM? But put in mind that DRAM is a commodity to work. Cost is very important for DRAM, right? Because think about servers, for example. They want to throw as many DRAMs as they can in a servers without really maximizing the cost. To minimize the cost, basically, they want to minimize the pen power. Something I don't know if you have learned in an electronics course or not, but it's been very important. Then, in fact, in a chip, Number one cost of a chip is the number of bins. It's not how many memories you have inside the chip. It's not how many uh, logic elements you have in the chip. It's the number of bins. Bins is the number one expensive element of each chip, right? So minimizing the number of bins would minimize the cost, right? 
How do I minimize if someone is thinking right now? I think that you are the design of the era, and you want to minimize the cost of the era. If I send the full address, well, first of all, usually how many bits do I have for an address? If you think about your machine, if it's a 64 bit machine, our whole machines are 64 bit, that means you have a 64 bit address, right? That means I need 64 bits, a bit for the dealer, right? It's a huge number of bits, right? In addition to a clock and band and so many things. But if I have the idea of sending these 64 bits into a stage where, like for example, send the first 30 first and then the second 30, then in that case, I minimize the number of bits by half, right? Because I send them in, in two stages, which means I can use the same band for sending multiple things over different sites, right? So this is the idea of multiplexed address in, in DRAM. And it's very common also in, in so many chips. If you want to minimize the number of bits, use one bit for multiple operations, right? Uh, that's that's basically the idea. It's good for cost, but the problem it leads to a huge latency and variability in access. As I told you, basically the, the operation is a two-stage way. So I send my raw address, go to the raw decoder, bring in the raw that I want to access to the what sense amplifier, which is what I call a raw buffer. This operation in DRAM is called an activated, right? So you activate the raw piece, right? You bring it from the cells into the raw buffer. Then once your data is in this small cache, in this small raw buffer, you use the raw decoder, sorry, the column decoder, you send that column address here, you decode the column, you bring in the requested column from the robot. And this is called the read write operation, right? So once you activate your row, you basically have your read and write from that robot. Then there is a question. Most DRAMs to increase performance, and again, performance is very important for modern DRAMs because I want to operate a very, very high bandwidth, very critical for memories. Then what do you do? Is instead of every time I go bring my row, put it in the row buffer, and then put it back, and the next time I do this, remember the concept of locality we discussed in caching, right? That if you access one thing, most likely you're going to access the game. And if you access one thing, most likely you're going to access this adjacent blocks I mean, right? This concept of factual and moral locality is also used in DRAM. What they do is they say, once I bring the row into the row buffer, this is few kilobytes. Two kilobytes, four kilobytes. Sometimes it's eight kilobytes, but few kilobytes, large amount of data. Then, if I access afterwards the rows, the columns I want from that row, I will not take this row and put it back. I will use this sense amplifier as a dash, which means the old row will remain there. What is the benefit of this? Think of your axing an array, okay, of integers, for example. Each element is eight bytes. So let's let's have this numerical example. So assume you are in your 2SI or 2SH and you are doing a for loop over an array, okay? And this array is an array of ints, which means each element is eight bytes, right? Uh, four, four bytes. Uh, first of all, we said from last time that the normal cache line size is 64 bytes in our machines, right? Which means 164, 164 byte cache line would have, have, would have uh, how many uh, elements? Well, 64 over four, uh, well, that's to the power six, to the power two, to the power four, the 16, right? So you have 16 elements of your array in one cache line, right? But if you, well, what is going to happen, maybe I should really add a slide. Uh, again, this is usually I, I discuss in an uh, in architecture course, but it's important to understand this with regard to the, the, the predictability of an embedded system. So we have, we have to go through this process. And I believe it's useful information for you anyway. Basically connecting between the software and the hardware in your mind, right? So assume I have this array here. And then it's an array of ends, okay? So it says it's four bytes. And I'm telling you that your cache is in fact a 64 byte cache line, which means if you're missing the cache, you'll go to the main memory and bring the whole line to it, right? This is how, how the cache is being composed. If you look into the previous slides. That means one cache line 
will have 64 over 4. So it will have 16 entries basically of the array. Right? If you think about it, assume that you are in your C code or Python code. You access the first element, element 0. Element 0 will be a cache mess. So I will name this M. Okay? Because the first element, assume it was there was nothing in the cache, it just misses. Then what about the second element? Has to be a hit, right? If you are not running any other task, I'm doing my static cache analysis. I brought the whole line because once I miss in the cache, I go to the main memory, bring 64 bytes. So if right now in my cache, I have this 64 byte line, I access the first element. If I go and try to access the second element, it's already on the same line, right? Which is already in the cache. So it will be a hit. So you will have basically 15 hits. And then you shift to another line. So you basically have another mess, and then you have 15 hits, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is in fact how people do static analysis. Basically, they say, I know my cache architecture. I know my program. See how the program executes, and then follow its behavior, right? If I was the cache, I'm bringing a whole 64 byte line. I know that this line will hold if my array is n since four bytes is going to hold 16 elements, right? So I can definitely say the first one might be a mess or a hit. It depends on different factors. But definitely, once I bring the first one, the remaining ones will be hits. Good. If I'm not interfered with other tasks. Good. Great. So now this is from a cache perspective. This is the last lecture topic. What we want to discuss right now is if I go to the main memory, and I assume my row buffer size, this sense amplifier from the previous line, assume it holds, uh, let's say for simplification right now, it's one kilobyte. Okay, so this is my 2D array cell. So this is the cell array. And this is the row buffer. So once I access, assume this was a mess, I go to the main memory, I activate the row, bring it to the row buffer. I don't really bring only a 64 byte. I bring one kilobyte. I can do the same math saying that one kilobyte will hold how many cache lines? So one kilobyte over 64. So it's 10 minus 6, that's 4 to the power 4. That's also 16 lines, right? So one row buffer would have 16 cache lines, right? So the idea is if I'm executing my program, first load will be a mess in the cache. Subsequent 15 will be a hit in the cache. If I go to request 16, well, 0 to 15, and then request 16, it's a mess in the cache. I go to the main memory. Do you think I will find my line in the row, or I have to activate the row again? What do you think? Any idea? Yeah? Yeah. So I have to do the same thing, which is you mean go to the cell, bring the whole, yeah, and put it in the row buffer, right? This is true if you don't keep the old one in the row buffer, right? But what if I told you I'm using this row buffer as also a cache that keeps whatever data in it until I explicitly remove it, right? In that case, what do you think? It will be there, right? So that's basically the idea of locality in modern DRAMs. DRAMs, for this exact reason, they don't really remove the data from the row buffer. They keep it there. Why? Because the concept of locality or 1090 that we discussed last time, most likely subsequent accesses will be to that row. So instead of really suffering the latency of activation, which is a huge latency, well, just take it from the row. Do a direct read write, right? Does this make sense? Is there any question? If I lost anyone here, please ask, because almost the whole lecture depends really on this theory of operation. So I don't mind really spending additional 10 minutes really re-going through it if you have questions. And as you can see, concept of locality concepts are really kind of apparent everywhere in terms of architecture. Like modern chips are based on certain uh, ideas or basically certain ways of thinking, and locality is one of them. Locality is a pillar in, in high performance systems. Good. But right now, if you think from the same perspective we have done last time, where caches were good because of their locality, 
but they were bad for embedded systems because of their huge variability. I can just say exactly the same thing here, right? Using this operation, this will be very good in terms of high performance, but in terms of predictability, I don't know. What if I'm set, I'm asking something? Think about the following. I kept asking all the subsequent cache lines here, and then I want to access the cache line that brought, that is that exists in another row. What do I need to do? Right now, it's in fact not enough to just do the same thing, which is bring the new row and put it here, because you have all data there that you still need to write. So what is going to happen is you need to write that row first before bringing the new row and then do the read write, right? So taking this concept, we end up having different types. <laughs> we end up having different types of accesses to the DRAM. The best case, it's an access that is not a hit in the row. A hit in the row buffer is basically only requires a read or write, right? It's very, very fast. Then a second type, which is what if initially the row buffer had nothing at all. In that case, you need to activate, this is the A symbol here, that row, and then do the read write, right? And then the worst case is you come to the DRAM, you request a row that is different than the one that exists in the row buffer. This is really the worst case. Why? Because you need to do three operations. First one is write back the old row into the cells, then activate the new row, and then do the new one. Good. With this huge variability right now, I want to show you some numbers in terms of, well, how does this variability really happen in React Native? If you are if you are asking about the yellow one or the when you when you oh yeah when you write it back okay so you you end it here basically or we call it write back because you might have to get something to to that row then you need to update the cell that point let's call it a write back operation okay you have recharge it's called the recharge which is charging that row back into the cells. This is this happens in this red thing here, which is the B here. So that's the B because of breach. So you first write back the old row. Why do I need to do this? When do I need to do this? If you ask a row that is different than the one that is already existing there. Assume, for example, there is row Z, right? Like I would your metric, there is row Z with the row buffer. But my request is to row one. Well, my data is not there, but I cannot really also bring row one directly because otherwise I would write with zero. So you need to write with you first to the cells, bring row one, then do the new one, right? On the other hand, if I was asking row zero, then well, it's just ahead, right? So I don't need really to bring it or I don't need to write it back. Good. Okay, so because of these operations and because of the circuit view of the new one, uh, there are what we call time constraints. Every single operation is a physical operation. For example, breaking data from the cells into the sense and verifiers, basically transferring data over wires. So it takes time. And because DRAM cells are a capacitor and the transistor, this charging and charging capacitor takes off a lot of time. We call these the timing constraints. And there is already an existing industry standard, it's called the JDIC standard, that tells us what is the time between every operation. For example, if I activated a row to act here, it's easier, for example, I need to wait for TRCD cycles, which is the row to cast command before doing the right interview. You don't need to remember all the names, but the idea is every single operation of these, for example, here, between activating that row and then being able to access it, there must be certain time that elapsed before you can do the next operation. Why? Because, for example, I want to make sure that the whole data is written to the row buffer before I do the read one. Correct. And this whole data writing to the row buffer takes some time. This time is dictated by the standard that is called RCD in this case. Right. Another example is that if you want to basically, once you have your data in the row buffer and you do the read operation, it takes some time. So if I go back again to our figure, once you have your data here, it also will take you some time to transfer them in the bins, right? So if you look into this diagram, 
once I did my write or read, it takes me some time to put the data on the bus. Take it from the internal DRAM since amplifiers to the bus between the DRAM and the C, right? There are so many time constraints here. The reason I'm breaking up the time constraints is that they are a huge source of variability for DRAM. So going back to our line, which is we need DRAM for embedded because we need high performance and processing amount of data that is no longer possible with instruments. Good. Then we cannot really embed DRAM directly into this. So we need to assess them in terms of predictability. How do we assess them? We introduce this metric that we call variability metric, which is basically saying, remember our figure of worst scale, best scale, average case, right? If I want to measure the variability, I'm going to say, I'm going to take the basically weighted mean between the worst case and the best case. So the idea is you subtract the best case from the worst case and you divide by the worst. This tells you the percentage of variability uh, with, between the best case and the worst case. So if you want to measure the variability going to the model here, first of all, is this metric make sense to you? I mean, that doing nothing here other than putting what we discussed before this figure. This one here. Remember that we have a variability in terms of execution or latency. I have a best case. I have a worst case. And I have an average case. Right? We had this figure before for execution time. It's just the same figure for latency. If I want to measure the variability in that figure, what I can what I can say is that, well, if I have no variability at all, well, it's a single line, right? If I have little variability, I would have something like this. If I have huge variability, I would have something like this, right? So in a, in a sense, the variability can be measured by the width of your window, right? What we call the variability window. Okay, what is this width? I know my point here is the worst case. My point here is the best case. So basically the width is the difference between both, right? And then if I want it to be a percentage, I'm just defining, dividing by the worst case. And multiplying by 100, right? Good. Okay. So to give you some numbers, again, I I I, I wouldn't really expect that you go all of the details how to obtain these numbers. You have to trust me that what we have done is we take an existing DRAM. The fact that I've got this study myself to show the numbers. I've taken an existing DRAM, the DR4 or DR3, look into the data sheet, have all the numbers, the binary constraints, and I was trying to measure. What is the best case scenario? What is the worst case scenario? Why? Because again, I'm interested in this ratio, right? So, and basically, because there are so many options, there are so many cases, and well, is the room hit the room conflict, or I do all the cases we discussed before, there are so many cases here that can happen. Just jumping all of this study, the summary is if you look into the best case versus the worst case, basically, this is the ratio between them. So if you take the difference and calculate the variability window, there is a 600% variability on accessing the DRAM. A huge amount of variability. That means your access can take, well, I guess this is in nanoseconds, so your access can take, uh, well, 10 nanoseconds and up to, I believe this is a couple of hundreds of cycles, well, 100 something nanoseconds, right? Worst case, yeah, it's 180 nanoseconds. So you see like that. A single ask can take 10 nanoseconds or it can take 100 plus nanoseconds, right? That's a 10 x difference, right? So you can see how DRAM is challenging for embedded. If you want to drive guarantees, well, it's too bad. If you always assume the worst case, well, that's very, very specific, right? Similar to what we have done for cache. If you assume everything is a mess, well, I mean, it's a huge uh, worst case latency or a bug. That does not really work for us, right? Good. And what I'm saying here is that this is even without the impact of the memory control itself on the chip. It's only covering the access latency of the DRAM. Why that's the case? Why uh, why DRAM is is huge in terms of variability? Accessing is one thing, but we said also here we don't take into account controllers. If we dig into account controllers with scheduling, it's also another problem. So let me stop here. Maybe we should have five minutes break because I assume that you guys are completely done with so many information. So we can have a
five minutes break and then we can see. Do you feel it's too much? Do you feel starting getting very, very complex compared to what we started with? Again, feel free to ask if, if you think this is too much. Ideally, well, you know, I'm trying to do that job with two different persons. Someone covering the basics of the architecture and then study its impact on very system. Ideally, this should have been two different things, right? One that is covering just architecture basics, which is an architecture for the enforce, which I don't think you have covered any of that there. And then we build on top of this investment. So, but I'm not assuming you know all the architecture details, right? So I, I wouldn't also basically expect in the exam that you know all this. I'm going only to assume you know what I have done. Okay, just to make sure I'm taking that the minimum common denominator across all of them. Thank you. 
But it is like in the most of the sequence and it's got all the things in it. That's fine. Yeah, do you think that would be a little bit of a strange time? It was me so long ago. It just sounds weird. It's supposed to be like they have a long period of time. Okay, hey, so let's let's continue. So if I go back to the original picture we had, we said that the main memory is an off a chip memory, right? And then there's a memory controller on a chip that is handling that C to the main memory, right? Why do I need a memory controller? Well, it's just, just the same idea of a memory bus arbiter, right? That memory is a shared resource that you need someone to do some scheduling on top of it, right? And this is a reason why we're discussing memory controllers, because there, there is a scheduling, and if we want to make this thing predictable, we have to make sure that the scheduling is predictable, right? So inside a memory controller, There are multiple types of, of scheduling techniques. In fact, the memory controller is, is one of the complex modules in any modern system on a chip. Because it wants to optimize for bandwidth and latency as well. So there is what we call uh, well, intra-bank scheduling or in, and inter-bank scheduling. So just to simplify the things for you, we already said that a DRAM is one array of cells, two D array of cells, right? Uh, rows and columns, right? But in fact, this was a, this was a simplification. All modern DRAMs to maximize parallelism, which also increase performance, they don't only, they don't only have one array; of cells. they already have multiple of them in value. So they call one array of them a bank, right? So this matrix of rows and columns, we call it a bank. And modern DRAM are composed of multiple banks. The good thing about banks is you can access them in parallel, and hence you increase your bank. That's the idea. If banks are good, why do I have multiple banks? And hence I can maximize them by bank. Good. So as you can see from that figure, there are multiple of these uh, 2G cells, or basically a matrix of rows and columns, which is what we call the banks. So there's multiple banks. Each bank has its own matrix of cells and has its own column decoder, row decoder. Well, that's a simplification, but you can think of it that way, and a robot. Good. Which means we we'll increase the profile, but we we'll also complicate the, the process or the functionality for the job. Why? Because I need to pay a request that goes to a certain bank. And well, what request to send? I need voices to the right. A request that starts in the row buffer or a request that starts in a different bit. To simplify the discussion, most memory controllers deploy two types of scheduling, two classes of scheduling. One of them is called an intra-bank scheduling. Good. Intra-bank means if I ignore all other banks and only focus on requests that are going to one particular bank, how I arbitrate between them. Good. So this is basically the intra-bank scheduling. For requests going to the same bank. For that case, well, we need to think intuitively of what a memory controller should do. Within a bank, what might be back by scheduling decisions? Well, you may know that within a bank, we might have different kinds of requests, but we already discussed. I request that hits in the row buffer. I request that goes to a bank that has a lower ID, which means has no connectivity. Or a request that has a data requested different than the one in the room, right? And the green, yellow, and, and, uh, and red three times records, right? If you're aware of your controller design and you want to maximize the performance, which request type would give higher reach? What do you think? They just think together, you are designing this thing, and you want to maximize the performance. Should I retrace the one that hits in the buffer? Should I retrace the one that misses in the buffer? Should I retrace the one that basically goes to a buffer that has nothing there? What do you think of all this space for, for bandwidth and movement? Should I say this is a bonus question to encourage you guys to contribute? Let's say it's a bonus question. 
for DT. In fact, this question does not only apply to the limit, it applies to it again, it will, it will make um, modules in which are architecture, but further than this, in fact, applies to anything that would require skidding. This, this applies to fuel speeding communication systems. This also applies to scheduling maybe exams or scheduling uh, uh, personnel to a certain task uh, or scheduling employees to certain jobs. It, 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 any type of scheduling, which is a general scheduling process, uh, basically would be the same way. If I want to maximize the true, the performance of my speed, which one is there? That, that makes sense. The one that fits in the box, right? The reason for this is this one takes less time. So if I serve it more, assume, for example, you have this sequence of accesses here. And just to, like I'm trying to, to abstract the problem, C for me is a request that conflicts in the loop, which means just now it's a different data. And assuming that I have a row head here, which is I see open because it targets the open loop. So C target a closed row and O open O targets an open loop. If you send this one, C is going to close the row in the row buffer and bring another row, right? What will happen? It will turn this open to close, right? Because the data that you request is no longer there. Right? Does this make sense? If I serve them in the order of the arrival, first come, first serve, this C requests a data that is different than maybe I should also give you some numbers. Just help visualize it. So assume that this, the one that is currently open in the row buffer is row zero. This one is targeting row one. This one is targeting row two. Forget about this one for now. This one is targeting row zero. This one is targeting row zero. If I serve them in order, what's going to happen? I will take the oldest one. I see that it targets row one, while the one that is open is row zero. So I have to close row zero, bring in row one, right? And then accept. But if I do that, this turned out to be a red type request, right? Like out of the three colors we had, this is a red type request because it's a conflict. What about this one? It's also red type because I want row two while the one that's currently open is row one, right? Okay, what about this one? It's also red type because I want row zero and what is the currently open row in, like if I look into the timing of the row buffer here, originally I had row zero. I closed it and bring, brought row one and then this is basically here, the first C arrived and then here the second C arrived, I'm servicing it, so it requests row two. This is also going to be a red, a red. And then for the open one, it targets row zero. Ah, it targets row zero. So it's no longer open because I want row zero while the one that is open is row two. So I turn it every single request a conflict. What is the problem? I just showed you in the variability window that a conflict in fact takes 100 nanoseconds plus, right? So I suffered the worst delay all over the request, right? Make sense? On the other hand, if I do what your friend suggested, I say I don't serve them in the order, but instead I serve them based on their hits. So if there is a hit request, I give it higher priority. Then if I look into the timing, row zero is currently open. I prioritize the O. The O is, is targeting row zero, so I leave row zero open, and this one is good. It's a green type. It's the one that is taking 10 nanoseconds. And then I will also take the second open. Then again, it takes 10 nanoseconds. So if I sum things up, this is 10, this is 10. Then what is after? Well, maybe I can serve. I no longer have anyone that is hit. I serve the conflict once. Unfortunately, they're going to suffer 100 nanoseconds. Plus 100 plus 100. So the total delay is 220 nanoseconds. Originally, I had four requests, every single of one, every single one of them is suffering 100 nanoseconds, and hence I took a total delay of 400 nanoseconds, right? You can see I optimized my total execution time in the memory by half, right? Almost a half. So that's better for through. Make sense? So prioritizing ready requests is a very common concept, again, everywhere, right? In, in, in real-time operating systems, or even in Linux, by the way, some of, some of the Linux versions might have this, 
we also have what we call shortest task first, right? Shortest task, what does it mean? But or shortest job first. It looks into the jobs that have the minimum execution time and schedule it first. And this is in fact shown to be uh, well, generally optimal or good in terms of performance, right? Okay, if you are studying your, your courses and you want to maximize your performance and have a good kind of uh, uh, spirit, what you do is you take the ones that will require the minimum effort, finish them first. That means you have basically are done with these ones and then you focus on the one that will require more time, right? This is also an optimization of, well, minimize switching overhead and making sure you have a high throughput at the beginning, especially, right? Okay. Good. We call this in memory control as a first ready, first come, first serve. Why we do this? Because we prioritize the head ones which are ready ones. So we call them first ready. And then if I no longer have any ready, I schedule things first come, first serve. Okay, is there any question here? Okay, so this is for the intra bank schedule, which is all requests are going to the same bank which means they are competing on the robot with each bank and its own bank. And then afterwards, and we said that between intra-bank, there are some requests that are conflict, some of them are open and we have studied them. Then if I go to the inter-bank, which the memory controller also assume I have big requests. So here I simplified the problem. I told you, once you schedule this one, you will send it to the memory. But in fact, that's not the case. You have multiple banks, assume every single one of them has an open request. Here I can only serve one request at a time. What do you do? At the time, it's at one side, but you can really overlap. What do you do? You have to build one among the open ones of different banks. This is the task of the interbank security. With the controller, has another sticker here that goes through all the banks or all the queues of the banks and pick one request among them, right? Then finally, because of the operation of the DRAM, another complexity is that the DRAM has a, a unidirectional data bus. That's one big problem in DRAM. That you can either read or write at the time. You cannot really do read and write simultaneously. Why? Because the bus either is going from the CD to the DRAM or the other way around. And to switch the bus from a read to a write or the other way around, it takes a time. It's called the bus switching, bus turn around time. And again, it's another delay. So that there was if I think the same way, you want to optimize your performance, you want to minimize the switching. What does this mean? Maybe you need to serve reads first, then write, so write first, and then read. You want to minimize the bus switch, right? So if I had read, write, read, write, read, write, read, write, maybe I should also give you an example here. Assume I have a sequence of, well, five requests read, write, read, write, read, and they come in that order. And forget about banks, different banks, same bank, doesn't matter now. If I'm telling you switching from a read to a write or from write to a read would entail an overhead of, let me try to find a reasonable number. Uh, this is usually an average of 15 cycles. So we talk about 10 nanoseconds. So assume that this switching delay is 10 nanoseconds. And I'm telling you abstractly, assume all of these are open. So they are going to suffer 10 nanoseconds each. If I serve them in that order, what is going to happen? If I want to calculate the total delay, what would be the total delay? I have to see every single request it's taking 10 nanoseconds. I have five of them, so that's five multiplied by 10. And then how many switches do I have? You have one switch here, one switch here, here and here. So one, two, three, four. So it's four multiplied by the switching delay. This is 90 nanoseconds, right? On the other hand, if you reorder things in a clever way, you say, well, once I serve a read, I bring in all the other reads first, and then I serve the two rides at the end. What would be your delay? You still suffer the single request delay as is, but how many switches do you have now? Only one, right? This one here. In that case, it's one multiplied by 10, so it's 16 hours, right? So you save 30% of your execution time. So scheduling requests at the same time also helps you improve your throughput. And this is what we call write batching in modern memory controls. The memory controller you have in your laptop, which is maybe hopefully 70% is an Intel one. If you have a Mac, it might be a different chip, but even the, the, the Apple one as well, they deploy write batching. 
which is this technique, which is you batch the writes into multiple batches, you queue them in a queue, and you serve them as a batch at once. Why do they do this? To minimize the bus turnaround time between reads and writes. Okay. One big observation here. All of this is targeting to increase what? Throughput, right? Performance, average case. But as you might imagine, optimizing for average case, as we have seen before, complicates our predictability and analysis, right? For example, if I have a read, what do I assume? I assume it arrives when the, my, my previous one was a read, so there is no switching, or my, my, my previous one was a write, and then I have switching. Is it open or is it close, right? Uh, does it target the same bank as the interfering request or it targets a different bank? And for that reason here, you can see all the cases we have discussed. How many cases do we have here? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and another five. So that's 15 cases, right, of types, right? Why each one of them has a different latency? Because it combines all of this together, right? Reads versus writes, close versus open, target same bank versus different bank, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, this is basically why it's written that way. It's very weird. Yeah, well, that's fine for now. Let's let's really cancel. And then I will I will look into it later. Ah, so we did it. OK. I want to draw and say, I want to show you that there is a problem with the That wasn't true. This is just a type of problem. So basically, the same problem we are facing, right? So these optimizations in our general purpose machines are very good for average performance. But this huge variability is a very bad in terms of predictability, right? I don't know what type of assume. What would be the solution? Well, in different classes, and you can apply also these two caches. I can do design, which means you know what? Those memory controllers and DRAMs were originally designed for average case. I want to use them in predictable safety critical very system, just redesign the memory control. So build a new chip, please, right? That's one option. The second option is say no. Like I cannot really afford that I need to come up with a new SOC and then maybe it would take a huge amount of time and thus you don't want to do this. You already have a very well established understanding and why you do this into a chip. So I want to use something like Raspberry Pi, for example, what we call a code solution, right? This is what they call codes here, commercial on the shelf solution. But I want still to use it in a predictable way. So what can I do? Try to analyze it, right? Do I try to do some applied analysis such that you can have some reasoning about the worst case execution. Good. First direction, there are so many solutions that try to redesign memory system. You don't need to worry about this. I just wanted to show you that there are multiple things. That summary of the essence is, well, remove all the architecture features that might lead to unpredictable behavior. For example, this idea of keeping the data in the row such that to increase locality ends up having the on time frequency, heads versus misses, right? You know what? All the time close the row. Such as that, if I go back here, here, if I don't keep my data in the row power for further FC, what will this reduce to? Another bonus question. These three times appear because I let the data open in the row power, right? If I don't leave it open in the buffer, which means every time I access, I do my full max and then put the data back in. Me. What will this reduce to? Easy question. Yeah, it would be the yellow one. Thank you. Right? Because idle means what means you are right to the bank. You don't have any data in the robot, right? If you already wrote the data, on the previous request, all the time you will be idle, right? 
Luckily, most existing FOTS controllers, in fact, have this idea of closed page FOTS, different closed page FOTS, which means you can configure your memory controller from the BIOS, for example, to say, you know what, don't really optimize for locality, keep it always closed, right? Why is it good for break? First of all, it's bad for performance, right? Because if you have high locality, right now you are unnecessarily going from here to here, right? But in terms of predictability, I no longer have variability, right? And if you think about it, we also have taken away some complexity from the memory control. That's another bonus. Out of the memory control discussions we have so far, maybe I should go to the slide and this will simplify the question for you. Among all these kinds of scheduling in the memory control, which one, in fact, by doing both page boards, they have simplified? I almost go Ah, yeah, okay. So just let, okay, maybe I take one step back and let's, let's discuss the code again. We said, I keep the link in the buffer. Here's the three types, heads, complex, idle stuff. Good for average case, but very bad. Perform uh, for for predictability. What do I do? Every time you access the row, close it back. And you said basically it will reduce only a single time, which is higher, right? Great. That's one benefit. But what I'm saying is that doing this works gives you another benefit. Out of the complexity of this memory control, all these scheduling techniques we discussed, what scheduling techniques we discussed so far? The new integral three, right? The interbank, which is first in this number serve, the interbank, which is breaking among different banks, and the redrive view. Right? Among these three, which one, if I apply post based policy, is way simplified or almost simple? That. Just like the conflict of West, because that's supposed to be. Yeah, it's an interrupt, right? Yeah, exactly. The one, again, I no longer have hits versus misses, right? So if I don't no longer have hits versus misses, there is no rating versus non rating, right? So everything, in fact, is first come first, right? So this complexity that we had here, with all this example reordering, and then I want to reorder the reorder one. There is there is no data in the robot, right? So no one is hitting and no one is complaining. Everyone is hiding, right? So this first ready first come first serve reduces to what? If I use load page policy, this scheduler reduces to what schedule? It uses to first come first serve, right? Everything will be in order, right? Okay, good. So that's one kind of better in increasing predictability in memory controls. Another one is instead of applying even first come first serve or some sort of arbitration between banks, rewriting the ordering, which is a fixed priority, just replace this with something that is predictable. What are the predictable ones we have discussed before? This round robin, this EDM, the examples you have covered earlier today, right? So also try to use a more predictable scheduling instead of first come first serve or first come first come serve can give you some predictability. The third direction is also be covered in caches. Up until this slide, we didn't say anything related to single core versus multi core, right? But if you follow me from the beginning of the, the course, we know that adding multi core would in fact complicate things more, right? Why? Because multi tools share these resources. They have the shared cache and we discuss why it's very complex there. They also share the memory controller and the DRAM, which means they complicate things. So often in uh, embedded systems, if you have a shared DRAM between multi tools, what they would do is they use partitioning, which also we have done in cache, right? They say, well, I didn't say what is the DRAM channel versus RAM, but it's basically another level of parallelness, but let's talk about bank again, which is the most common partition. I say instead of allowing, give me a second to take this question, okay? Instead of allowing all the fools to access any bank, which means you are right to a bank, you have an interference from all the other fools, I dedicate banks for fools. So core zero will access bank zero only, core one will access bank one only. And hence, at least I don't have an intra bank interference, right? Does make sense? So you see now another concept that in fact repeats again for increasing predictability, right? Partitioning something that we've already started. Using predictable arbitrage, something 
when we discuss the bus, right? So just people are recycling the same idea for different resources. Right? Sorry, yeah, I'm Ah, uh, yeah, what is those basic points? So let's go back here. So you understand that why do we have these three lines, right? Because we said when you bring your rule into the buffer, you just need it for future access, right? So this depends on the status of the coming request, whether the request is the same data in the buffer or a different one, or there is no data in the buffer at all. You end up with three times, correct? Close page, this is we usually call this open page for it. Open page or open walk policy. Page is a book, basically a page in a DRM is a book. So open walk is called open walk policy. Open walk policy means leave the row, leave the data open in the row, right? Close means no, don't leave it open for future all the time when you bring your data to the row buffer. Before you finish the request, put it back, which means that coming request in the future, if I look here, I no longer have different possibilities. All the time, I'm ending up having an idle loop. Why? Because that previous request has already used. Okay, good. So here, we didn't really go through any of the details of trying to make it predictable, but I gave you the S, right? And what people really do. To impose predictability by redesigning some of the elements of the context. The second solution is, in fact, to try to analyze it, like trying to say, I impose no, no modifications at all, mainly because I don't want to lose the performance. And then I don't want to go through the hassle of redesigning a new chip because verification and design site is very, very, for those of you that already went into internships in third and fourth year, um, especially with the AMD, IBM, Dell, NVIDIA. You know that there are so many teams only for verification for new chips. So it takes two to three years to design and verify a chip, even if in fact they are not verifying much the micro ticket. If you introduce a new chip completely, this is almost a five to ten years. No one, no one right now is in fact doing it. If you look into all the companies that work all the generation, they never propose a completely new update, right? This doesn't happen, right? So redesigning your chip is a huge effort that no one wants to go through. That's one thing. The second thing is, uh, because of the verification cost, the second thing is you don't want to lose the performance. I say, for example, do partition, close range force, use TDM, the micro in a, in a memory controller. I lost so many performance in NVIDIA. Originally, I wanted to bring in NVIDIA addresses because of their performance, right? And because of their capacity. So if I lose so many performance, it's maybe no longer, well, a valid solution, right? So this is why the second direction is also a very common direction right now, especially for industries, to say, you know what, I'm not going to redesign anything, but I'm going to look into the existing architecture, try to analyze it, understand all the microarchitecture details to come up with a boundary, right? Good. So here I'm showing you an example of some of the analysis. Uh, I'm thinking that in fact this might be too much detail. Let me think. No, in fact, okay, so that's that's good. I can we can improve with this. It's it's a good to show you the full cycle of the post. Yeah. So basically, this this trend of analyzing DRMs uh, is is a recent trend. Why? Because here are very common situations. Trying to do an effort to analyze them uh, will take you a lot of time. Uh, so what I'm showing you, you like the example of which the analysis. Right now, in fact, an analysis of, of, of our paper, it's a paper that we had five years ago. The good thing about this is, in fact, we won a best paper award in one of the top avenues uh, for embedded systems because we have done something that is, I think, is quite interesting. She said, instead of taking Raspberry Pi and then analyze it, and then someone else, if they want to use something else, you have to take the new platform and analyze it, we can handle it. Any other chip is a real, whatever it is, right? Or do we give you? I'm going to give you a framework that should be applied to any existing system on a chip, right? And then you just apply these concepts and they should work completely fine, right? So we, we studied the full state space of memory behavior. That's one thing. The second thing is we said we're not only going to focus on memory controllers and DRAM, but with the observation that 
Memory behavior will also depend on the pipeline of the processor as well as the operating system. We are going to take a holistic system approach, right? So as you can see from this picture, we we'll ask ourselves the question, okay, memory behavior will depend on what? Definitely it will depend on the memory controller processing. MCA is a memory controller, but also it depends on the processing element architecture, like the CPU, the core is the pipeline, and also in the operating system configuration. How that's the case? So the summary of this is the following. Memory controller policy is very real, right? That's the things we already discussed. Interbank scheduling, intrabank bank refresh compressor, read-write application, right? That's basically the main things here. In terms of processing elements, multiple ideas. The first one is in, in modern systems on a chip. This will really level to new, right? For example, if you look into Qualcomm and Snapdragon, if some of you already enter into the early market, we have the real, is the almost, oh, uh, Snapdragon, the main processing element, so cluster, the GPU and the CPU, right? In addition to some of the other accelerators we have. GPU is supposed to be very high to but CPU is a latency sensitive already. This is what they did. So the idea that we put there, I'm not revealing it, it's really public yet. So, so what, they, what they do is they always give a priority for the CPUs when it goes to the shared resource, right? So I say, if I have a request from the CPU, another request from the GPU, I have little to pay. I'm retrying the latest sensitive one, which is the CPU, right? So in modern systems on a chip, you already have little to pay. Why that's important? Because think about Mexican intelligence system today. The Raspberry Pi, if I'm running something on the course, the ARM 53 course, there is latency sensor. For example, taking the data from the camera, the frames, and try to process them to take the action to the microcontroller. Exactly in the same time, which is something we don't do in the project because of the very limited time, I don't want to publicate it for them, what you guys have. But I can do something here. I can say, I can also use the camera frames to in fact look some of the environment to learn from it, right? Using machine learning or reinforcement learning for them. Well, what is the best standard on the Raspberry Pi SOC to do this? The GPU, right? So uh, if you use the GPU, it might interfere with the CPU task, which is latency sensitive and safety critical. But I can use prioritization to always say all the time, prioritize the ARM 53 cores, even if the GPU has something to do. Good. The priority is one angle which is a processing element feature, but can embed the memory city, right? Because if you have two memory requests, one of them is from a high priority processing element, it will go through, regardless of free if it's from preserve, open bridge policy, same bank, different bank, that's one thing. The second thing is, in processing elements, it matters a lot in terms of memory interference, whether we have uh, in order processors versus out of order processors. How many of you do you know what the in order and out of order processors? If you don't need to be discuss this in four DM, I think there is a thing is this point is not the way it should be. You discuss those at least an in order by line and out of order by line. Like for those that talk for DM, I know some of you didn't take four DM, but for those that talk for DM, you definitely discuss in order versus out of order pipelines. Yes or no? We did, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. Thank you. So, you, at least you know what is an out of order versus in order pipeline. For those that didn't take the course, the idea from a memory perspective is, in fact, very, very simple. If you have an in order core, it can only send, if you have a load store operation, and you send it to the memory, the pipeline has to stay idle until the memory comes back, right? You cannot really reorder instruction. That's why it's called in order. So if you have a load operation that is a mess in the cache, for example, go to the main memory, everything stalled until it comes back. So from the memory perspective, an in-order pipeline can have, or a processor, can have only one load or so operation maximum at a time. It cannot have, cannot have multiple because it, because it cannot really reorder and analyze. On the other hand, for an out-order core, because out-order can reorder instructions, if I miss, if I have a load that misses and go to the main memory, the pipeline completes execution, I have another load that can also go to the memory. So that means out of order tools can have multiple outstanding layers going to the memory to be a case. Can someone tell me why do I care? The another bonus question. Why it matters? We're talking about main memory here, right? 
white matter will pass in order to preserve for the period of the case I give you right now. This is my question. Easy question, some of the biggest one. Yeah. Yes, this is one I can do. If I have all the four, I don't suffer the full pain. If you over them, then you really don't so well. Like I already gave you this equation before, right? Our final target is to do this. I have a worst case execution time that is composed of worst case computation time. This should be equal. Plus the memory time. Memory time is the total number of memory requests. So basically, uh, I will call total number of memory requests R. Multiply this by the worst case latency of every single request, right? We had this equation when we talked about caches as well, as well as arbitration. Right now, this equation is assuming that every single request is going to suffer or might suffer the worst case latency, and I add all of them up. So assume, for example, I have a program that has 10 load store operations. I take the 10, multiply by the 100 nanoseconds we had in the DRAM. This is your worst case latency. But this means one, one thing. It means there is no overlap at all between these requests, right? So they add up, right, to the latency. In the case of out of order, that's not the case because I can overlap them. So I suffer less latency. That's the good side of out of order. What is the bad side? Yeah. Hmm? Less predictable, yes, uh, with, because of variability. But there is another angle into it as well, yeah? Sorry, can you say that again? Yes, that's that's yeah, that's that's correct. But I I'm looking for something else. So yeah. Switching between what and what? Switching between what and what? Different tasks. Okay, how, how does this impact whether you have out of order versus in order? How does this impact the switching time between tasks? I believe you are in the right track, but we need to polish the line of truth a little bit. So think, you guys think if you have a multi-core architecture, okay? So we discussed in caches, if you have a multi-core, you need to account for the interference from the other cores, right? We have seen this in round robin, for example, or TDM, when we said, if I have N cores, I need either to suffer N multiplied by the slot or N minus one in round robin. So you need to account for that, right? So now I have taken half of the way to you for the answering the question. How does the number of outstanding requests from a core would impact this idea of multi-core interference? Basically, if you have assumed that you are a CPU right now, okay, and this CPU and, and the safety critical task is running on top of an in-order core. So it's very simple. There is no variability. There is no uh, less predictability. It's predictable and good and everything is fine. But on the same system on a chip, sharing the main memory with me or the or the bus or the cache, there is another out of order high performance pool that is running a non safety critical task. What is going to happen? This non safety critical task and the out of order pool can issue multiple outstanding requests. So instead of assuming that I can suffer one request from that core at a time, I can suffer multiple, right? So the interference also increases, right? This makes sense. For this purpose, whether you have in order versus out of order codes, it will impact how much interference you need to account for from the other codes, right? Make sense or this is a question? Okay, so this is from the processing and perspective. From the operating system perspective, the idea here is that we said we can apply bank partition, right? I already added bank partitioning as part of the hardware beefcation. But in the reality, we have already discussed this and said partitioning in, in caches. I can deploy some partitioning at the operating system level, especially when I do the virtual or physical memory translation uh, or virtual memory management at the operating system. I can, in fact, do bank partitioning by modifying the bits of the core that goes to a bank, right? So bank partitioning can be applied. Let me see where this is written. Uh, this is the, yeah, here. So pipeline, I will discuss with you the pipeline. Uh, uh, 
um, read rightly order is a memory controller stuff. First read, first come, first serve is a memory controller stuff. Priority is a processing element. Partitioning. So operating systems are able to partition banks by coloring them. There is already existing reading implementation which really is able to assign different banks to different cores based on only the defined operating system without touching the hardware. So for that purpose, we wanted, as I told you, we wanted to state space explore all the possible combinations in any system on chip. For example, I gave you the example of Snapdragon where it can have priority between cores, right? But what if in my Raspberry Pi, I don't have this prioritization? So you have to assume both. You can prioritize cores or there is no way to prioritize it. And you study it, right? Then at the same time, I told you that some of the systems can manage to partition banks to cores. What if I can no partition? Or I can partition some tasks and some for the right line. What if I have a mix of in order and out of order? What if everything for me is in order? For example, Raspberry Pi, all the ARM53 are in order core. Uh, and what if I have all of them around? Order? That's also part of the state space. It's a bridge. Again, what is this idea of state space? Is that instead of analyzing a single system or in shape, you want to cover what does it impact, what does it that that impacts the memory behavior, and study all the possibilities in each distinct black, right? In doing this, this gave us like a total of 144 possible platform or possible system or chip instances. One instance, for example, for us is the Raspberry Pi. Another instance is, uh, I don't know, like uh, again, an NVIDIA NAND or a CPU or a, a Xilinx next NVGA with, with ARM tools, right? So it can be anything. And then after doing this state space exploration and looking into all the possibilities, we went into all of them and tried to generalize. It's not really possible to take every single platform and analyze it straight. That means we really didn't do anything, right? I mean, this is not the same as telling people go ahead and bring your own platform and analyze it. We want to generalize. To be able to generalize, we have taken cases and we said there are features that will lead to unpredictable behavior no matter what. There are features that are very good in terms of predictability regardless of your platform. So making these general observations kind of helps us to reduce the possibilities and then generalize some sort of general analysis that gives us total more skills. So these figures here, basically, they are just a nice way of showing this equation. How can you generalize the analysis to be able to bring in some number here, and this number can plug it into the total worst case action time for any sort of plan, right? So just to make sure you're not lost into the details, we did the lecture in this lecture the following. So we said DRAM is needed for embedded systems because of performance and capacity of data. Then it's very bad in terms of predictability, as it is. I need to do something. You either redesign your chip or you analyze it. We discuss some of the redesign elements, well, aside from the fact that we discussed how DRAM even operates. And then we showed some possible directions of redesigning it, including partitioning, closed beta policy, using a predictable arbiter other than first free, first come first serve. And then we said, if I don't want to touch the hardware, because it's not very viable, it's not very efficient to do so, and I'm going to lose performance, then analyze it. And I've shown you one possible example of how you can really generalize that. Good. By doing this, we have kind of concluded at a very high level. Well, what This topic is quite complex, but I wanted to summarize it. So that's all for today. If you have questions, please ask or you can come by if you'd like. And then we uh, next lecture, we're going to go back just to show you. Uh, just give me a second. If I go back here, you see what we have done. We have covered this. Last lecture, we have covered this. The one before, we have covered that. Next lecture, we're going to go inside the CPU itself and see what, what might impact predictability versus not. Right. Good. And for those that didn't take for DM or our picture concept, I hope that this part of the course is also kind of reaching this knowledge gap such that we end up with an architecture knowledge and knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.